Welcome everybody. I don't know what the plan is for the other door, just leave it open and then we get this done. And I think it's the last slot of the day anyway, so I don't want to keep you too long. So uh, my name is Marcel Holtmann and I will present a little thing to give a little bit insight on an education hardware project that we have uh, combined with the Zephyr open source uh, uh, RTOS and what you can do with it and give you a couple of hints and ideas what you can do with it if you want to actually do it further or start, paying with, uh, start toying with it. Um, as usual, a little bit of disclaimer, Zephyr project, trademark of the Linux Foundation, Bluetooth is a trademark of Bluetooth SIG and all other trademarks are their respected owners. So just to keep that out of the way and don't have to do any attribution in my, during my presentation. Um, I'm repeating this one since I've, this is the second talk I'm giving today. Um, I've been working on Bluetooth for uh, pretty much 17 years now, uh, so it's a really long time and the technology is still around and used, so that's good. Uh, I maintain the Bluesy stack, which is the Bluetooth stack for Linux since 2004, since that has been for a while. Uh, in the meantime, I created a couple of open source projects, a connection manager for Linux, a telephony stack, a full telephony stack for Linux, proxy services, uh, and also an embedded Linux library and a new wireless daemon. That talk will come on Thursday, so if you're interested in that one. Um, I joined Intel in 2007, so that's my uh, 10 years now this year, but it has been a while as well. Uh, I sit on the uh, architecture review board for the Bluetooth SIG, where we actually adopt the new specs. I chair the internet working group um, and also driving the Bluetooth mesh standardization, which will be coming out sometime this year as one of the new standards for uh, Bluetooth. Um, so um, let's dive into this one, um, Zephyr. So I took this uh, text from the Zephyr website, uh, and it's pretty much an Artos like anybody else. You can pick what any Artos you want, but Zephyr is one of the newer ones, uh, and from an Atos point of view, it's the same thing. But it's not an Intel architecture only thing. It will work on multiple architectures like ARM, ARC, and probably others in, in the future. So it's pretty much open, community driven. At this point, this is nothing really special. It's just okay, someone did another Atos. Uh, what is really special about this that it's supposed to have a really truly open source community, but with a background that you actually can build products on top of this. Similar to how Linux is used in the enterprise world, you have something where you actually have an open source project, but it's used in a commercial form. And that's really the intention, and the licensing and everything supports this. What is more interesting, what I actually highlighted here, that we decided to put a connectivity stacks, or multiple of them actually, at the heart of the Artos. So with a lot of Artos, you have, oh, you have maybe one that has a little bit of an IP stack, it has this feature, that feature, and you're actually picking your Artos depending on what connectivity feature you want, or some of the other features. You're not really picking one that has everything. And the goal is here pretty much we want to have good Bluetooth low energy support. We can have a good Bluetooth classic support. We want to have IPv6 support. We want to have IPv4 support, uh, 16.4 thread, wireless uh, Wi-Fi, and so on and so forth. So connectivity is at the heart of it. Because fundamentally, when we go into the sensor world or the uh, embedded devices world for the IoT space, you can't live without an IoT uh, connectivity stack. And you want this deeply integrated into the operating system so that you actually have the smallest footprint possible and don't have the piggyback on other stacks or just buy this one with that OS abstraction, buy that one with that OS abstraction, pick that open source one and so on and have to glue them together and maintain them. So you're getting really everything in once and can focus on your application development. Um, this is a little bit of an uh, older slide that I grabbed from the Zephyr project. Uh, the difference is the microkernel and the nanokernel were merged into unified kernel also, just ignore that piece. The interesting part is really on the right side where, as I just said, the connectivity is part of it, and we want to building this all in. If you get Zephyr, you get all the connectivity solutions at once, and we will keep improving them and driving them with new standards um, and uh, extending them. Um, right now, it's ARC, x86, and ARM supported. You have the standard stuff, and you have a really nice set of APIs on top of this. The crypto comes with it, and it's really deeply integrated. Um, so when you do this from an ecosystem point of view, this is what I mentioned earlier. It's like, if I want to build something, I'm going to pick a piece of hardware. And hopefully the hardware manufacturer gives me a board uh, and then gives me a uh, board support package for this one, says, okay, this is how, where your pins are, this is what GPOs are, et cetera. And you don't have to worry about anything else. So if that's there, something that's community maintained, it's already, you actually picked a board and it's already everything's there. If you get Zephyr, you get the connectivity tag. If you're looking for something doing with Bluetooth for energy, that's already there. The only thing you really have to do is the vendor differentiation. So you want to write an application that does something special, you focus on that one. Not on the rest of integrating everything else and picking, oh, I need, hold on, I have an Atos now, now I need a connectivity stack, now I need an IP stack or something else. 
that's supposed to be already there. And I think the important word is really it's community maintained and it's a commodity. Um, some companies will still think you can make money with these kind of things, but reality is Bluetooth has been a commodity since a long time, and if you think you can sell a Bluetooth stack, I don't think you're going to make a lot of money with this. So there's a lot of commodity in there, and this goes for an IPv6 stack, uh, 6 low support, thread support, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of technology that is just there. The differentiation happens with the application that you build on top of and what you do with the hardware. Um, so that's for Zephyr, and I think there have been a bunch of Zephyr talks already this today, and there will be a couple of more where you can actually learn a bit more and go on. I think, if I remember this correctly, after this one, there's a Zephyr buff uh, somewhere in one of the rooms. You can go there if you need to learn something more. Um, getting to the hardware side of this talk, which is interesting. So um, the BBC took uh, uh, one of the boards and they built one of these funny ones. I'll get a little bit on this detail what it actually is. So they had the idea that they want to do something for education. And uh, they, they went around, okay, we need to get people a little bit technically more involved and have them tinker around in the maker community and so on and so forth. And we have big boards like Raspberry Pi, Minnow board, and so on and so forth. We can actually do a lot of things with it running Linux. But when you actually go into the embedded space, it became a lot more complicated to actually get a small board where you can have something really small and can run on a coin cell battery or something smaller. Um, try to run a minnow board on a coin cell battery, uh, you will heavily badly fail. So you need a big battery pack, where same as the Raspberry Pi. So they had the idea, okay, let's get something out there. And they actually gave one of these boards to I think every seventh grader um, uh, in the UK got one for free. So they just built them and then sent them out and after that one they started selling them. I think they go around for like between 10 or 15 bucks uh, uh, right now. So they're really easy to come by and they're kind of nice. And the reason why I'm saying they're kind of nice because they put a lot of things together that you can't get in the same package. So you have two programmable buttons. You can do something with it. You have a 5x5 LED matrix on there, which is kind of nice. You have extra pin outputs that you can use and you can even short them with your fingers if you want to press them. Um, you have an accelerometer and a compass on there as well. Um, you have a battery adapter, so you can easily hook up a battery and then charge the battery. And then you have an uh, ARM Cortex-M0 with a Bluetooth Low Energy uh, support built in from Nordic. So that's what you're getting all with it. Price point, they put, looked at this one, it's only 60 megahertz and only 16K of RAM, so they took the lower end, so that's what you're getting into. But fundamentally, you're getting a lot of things to toy with if you just want to have an education tool where you have a matrix display, we can show like uh, some characters or uh, show errors or just do some indication. You have buttons to press, you can hook them up with the pins to some other sensors that you want to attach to it. And you have an accelerometer and a compass already built in so you can use them to actually do movement and so on and so forth. And you can do it battery powered and they're shipping them with battery packs, we just put them up and then can run around with this. So all in all, a really nice combined package, um, which is great if you want to actually just tinker with something or give it to, uh, as I said, they did their seven graders. Uh, let them play with it. Um, the only thing I found a little bit weird on this one is the problem really what they decided on how to do with the software. So, so the hardware is pretty much open, they tell you what it is and you can easily get it for cheap. Um, but from the software side they decided to actually, oh we're going to take the whole operating system pretty much uh, closed source. So they uh, built a Bluetooth stack in there, built an operating system in there and they said okay, you can build your applications but that's the only thing you can do. If you actually want to do anything with the great stuff you have in there and do something, oh, I want to learn something about Bluetooth, I want to do some security research, I want to do anything else and figure out how things actually work, you were actually locked out. You could access them remotely and tr trigger the LEDs or read out the status of the buttons or you can load some scripts in there. So it was pretty much the Arduino style thing where you can have some sort of high level language and then do something with it. Um, which is great if you want to get some people interested and I think probably seven graders is great, but you could actually do so much more with this one if you would get access to the rest of the hardware. And that's where, at this point, fundamentally Zephyr comes in. So we actually have the top one with are allowed to play with, the bottom one you have actually no access to it whatsoever. And this changed fundamentally uh, with uh, Zephyr. So we have a Zephyr application, that's really nothing different, we just write a different application. But good, you get the full source code for the Zephyr uh, Bluetooth Low Energy host stack, which you can run and replace all the top parts that you've currently seen. You get full open source for the Bluetooth controller side, so you can even access natively the radio and do some other things with it that uh, the chip actually supports, but nobody would ever previously let you and do some tinkering with it. And you obviously have the still the Zephyr kernels, you have the raw OS primitives and can do something with it, even accessing the thermometer on the chip itself, which they don't even expose anywhere else. So you can do a lot of things with this one uh, and 
open more potential on this hardware. That's already cheap, an education tool to begin with, and now it can be even more an education tool for higher education, and you can get easy access and play with it. Um, and I'm thinking we're going to start now uh, actually playing with this one so we can see what's uh, going on there. So um, you need the Zephyr SDK. Um, and once you have the Zephyr SDK, you can actually get really quickly started. Get the SDK, it's a tarball, it's nicely built together. One of the big advantages of Zephyr is that the SDK team actually gives you the SDK for all the architectures together. You install it once, it's a little bit big, but once you've got over yourself and actually you have to install uh, a couple of hundred megabytes and install it, uh, after that one you can swap between architectures quite easily and move from x86 to ARC or ARM without just only changing the board. So you need to get to the Zephyr directory and then pretty much say with sample program you want to compile and then just tell it the board. And the board definition is already there. You don't have to build your own board definition. It's already there. It's BBC Microbit. We already put this in. Uh, you build it and then the only thing you need to erase the flash and then you flash it into the chip and then you can uh, access the console on that one and that's where you're getting it. And I hopefully, if I'm trying the demo now, this will actually work. So, um, of course not. Hold on. Okay. I think it becomes readable now, right? Okay, so um, let's get this one attached. As I said, it can operate a battery, but pretty much we have a micro USB adapter. You can just want to attach to it. Um, and that's about it. So I just built the uh, sample that gives you uh, uh, access to the button and puts the button state out onto the console. Oh, sorry. Nobody realized that I forgot actually to erase the memory. So we erase the chip. the application. As you can see, this goes really quickly in the end, so you can do a couple of iterations. You can do something wrong. Start <coughs> the terminal, and then you can start pressing the buttons on these ones, and then it will just tell you that the button press for this time. A uh, couple of lines of demo really quickly, and once you have the SDK installed, you have a really quick turnaround time. So it's not compile and wait a long time, run this on this. It's all everything really quick. So let's try a little bit uh, more of the fancier ones. So, oh, sorry, that was my bad. I have to build it first. So obviously we have a couple of Bluetooth examples in there as well. So if you want to do a simple beacon, like an Eddy Stone beacon, you can take a beacon example and just build it. Erase the chip. Mm. Flash it on there. I will automatically restart, and now you pretty much the BBC micro, micro bit uh, acts as a beacon for an Eddie Stone now. So, um, and to prove this, I actually forgot to take out my. Lovely USB dongle. You probably can scan for this one as well, but I need to put in. Yes, 
I think it says Zephyr test beacon or something. You should probably easily find it. Let's just scan for it, see if it finds it. Oh, uh, yeah, by the way, the Hilton has every door lock is a BLE device, so we'll see a lot of BLE devices in this hotel. So that screws it up a little bit. There's an app you can download to unlock your door. Oh, yeah, no. It actually does work. So I did this earlier to demo this one in my room. Uh, I found the beacon. And obviously now it becomes a little harder to find it. Too many devices around here. Uh, it will broadcast the Zephyr project URL, so you could pick up the URL. Can you? Oh, there it is. Actually, it's a good idea. So there you get your Eddie Stone beacon. And if you would decode this, uh, probably need to make this bigger as well. Uh, and if you would decode this one, you would see that this is actually the Google Eddie Stone URL. And as, with, as, as quickly as that, you have turned uh, uh, the BBC micro bit in a beacon and can use it. And you put a battery into it, you can just walk around with it. Okay. So let's do a little bit more complex one. Okay. Sure, go ahead. Do you mind showing the code? Oh, you want to see the code? Just to see what, how, what it sure. looks like. Just so that you can feel for how much code it is. So that's the code that you need to actually build a beacon. So you include the Bluetooth headers. You build your beacon structure, so there are a couple of extra defines for this one if you have to build them, so it's the advertising data, and it's documented how you actually build them together. And after that one, the only thing you really have to do is uh, you enable Bluetooth, so you have the BT enable call in uh, Zephyr, and then you get a callback when it's actually completed, and once it's completed, you just say, okay, now I'm starting advertising, and you tell it what to, how to advertise it, it's not connectable, and then you give it the data array that you just previously built, and that's all you really need. So, um, forty-seven lines of code, and that's including comments and copyright header on the on the top. So, rather easy. So let's get let's try to turn the Eddie Stone into a into a mouse. So there's an example in there where we actually pretend to be a mouse. And with that one, then you could actually find it with um, operating systems like OS 10 or Linux or Windows, and then you can see how you can actually connect to it. So, same thing, procedures again. Pick the application, build it. Chip erase. Program it in. And as soon as it's programmed in, it will reboot the chip, and then it will start it as a hit device. So if I then would just uh, and then you see um, the test uh, mouse device, it goes there. I'm starting the mini com now as well, since it will give me the pin on this one. So I'm starting this one as well. Oh, of course, I only tried already to pair with it. Um, Oh, sorry, you're mumbling. You couldn't hear what you were saying. Oh, I was mumbling. So someone, um, I'm starting the minicom as well, and then you can actually get the passkey that you have to put in. But if I do this in a public space, and people already see that I'm advertising, they're trying to already pair with me. So I assume someone successfully did this before me, as you see from the status. <laughs> And then you pretty much turned now the micro bit in a mouse device. Oops. So you can also turn it into a heart rate monitor. building the heart rate 
application and same goes again. Chip erase, flash it in. And now it's a heart rate device, and hopefully nobody tries to mess with me right now. So I can actually use it. So trying to attach this from trying to find it now. Let's see if it's available. The other reason is someone already connected for me and I can't find it anymore. So. Okay, let's see if we're gonna <laughs> give this another chance. Live demos. What's with devices with the multicast bit turned on? They are uh, the multicast bit has a different meaning in Bluetooth. Okay. So it finds a lot of devices here. Hasn't found the thermometer yet. So it remembered it from the last time, but I don't know if it will. Uh, okay, so luckily I remembered the address from the testings. So it went on this one, did the service discovery, and then you have it now. And then you can have, uh, you just select the attribute for the heart rate. So let's find the heart rate, heart rate measurement. So that's 006, 007. You select that one and then you set, put notifications on and then it keeps telling you the heart rate. So this is obviously faked in this example because we have no sensor attached to it, but you would attach a sensor to it, or read your heart rate, and now you actually get the heart rate out of this one, and you can monitor this one. And this will even work with any application um, um, that has a native uh, heart rate support. Um, you can also read out the attributes. So let's take one for, let's say, uh, model number information. That's 12, 13, and then you just can do a read on it, and then tells you, okay, this is running on a Nordic and I have chip with that packaging, because we put the device information into the sample as well, you can read them out, same goes for battery information, and so on and so forth. And then it disconnects from it. So there's one uh, nice feature that These chips actually have a thermometer on it, which doesn't measure the environment uh, temperature, it measures the temperature of the chip itself. this in. In this case it just only puts out the temperature on the uh, console. You start your terminal again and it reads out the temperature. It's around 35 degrees. I think uh, in the hotel room upstairs it's around 32 degrees. So it runs a little bit hotter now since I've been using it. As like I said, it's not the environment, it's the temperature of the chip itself. Um, and obviously now you can start combining these ones, put these out, take the exometer, put it out on the uh, uh, hit device, etc. One other neat thing is, since we have full control over their software, we can actually say, oh yeah, it's great to run the application on it, but maybe actually you want to do some hacking with it and some other tools. You can actually turn this into a Bluetooth dongle and attach it to your Linux side. So I'm taking this small one back off again and building one of the other samples that we have. So there's a 
sample that is called HCI UART. So what it fundamentally does, it turns the uh, uh, console into a full HCI device and you can just attach it to the Linux system and then uh, use that chip and uh, play with it. Which means you can actually modify the firmware and do modifications and do some hacking over the air. So it goes the same way, you just build it, chip erase, flash it back in. The Linux side currently has no devices attached, and on the Linux side, uh, you just go then, okay, take that device on the, on the UART and attach it to the system. Oh, that's not good. That's not working. One more try. That looks better. So the Linux kernel went through all the setup, so fundamentally we're treating the whole device now just as a pass-through. Um, and again, you can, and you would scan for devices and you don't see the thousands and thousands of door locks around. Which means at this point you can start tinkering with the firmware, but you don't have to actually rely on actually doing an application. You can run your application on Linux, but you can actually do some other things there and can do things from specs that aren't even released yet, do further development of something, add some features that you might be missing, and so on and so forth, and move this as a flexible test result by combining Linux and Zephyr together to do something. Okay. Any questions on that? Go ahead, please. Can you do something really useful with it? For example, what you sniff? Because what you show is just. So, um, you can buy a cheap man sniffer. So, the chip, how it operates, it operates on one frequency at a time. Which means, if you want to just monitor on something on a single frequency, you can get everything on that frequency really easy. But Bluetooth uses 40 uh, channels, which means you have to monitor 40 frequencies. The chip can't do 40 frequencies at the same time. For that one, need you wipe and sniffer, or 40 of these that you put together. So the is not useful You can. It's just not a high quality sniffer. So you, you will miss packets that you would normally get. So you have to deal with the error rate on this one. But yeah, you can build fundamentally a sniffer out of that one as well. Uh, we don't have one in Zephyr yet. So people are invited to actually do something about it and put one in, but it's possible. It doesn't replace a white man sniffer, though. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. So what's the uh, sort of the, the development flow of the separate? <clears throat> I mean, if you see, you write code, you can compile it, put it on the device and see if it's working or not. Is there some way you can, if you had a more complex application, to, to run it sort of, sort of on an emulator or something? Yes, you before can. Before you float, before you flash it? Yeah, you can also run, uh, I would advise you to go to Johan Hedberg's talk tomorrow because he shows, will show you how to do this in an emulator and also you can use local hardware, put like a Bluetooth dongle, put that in an emulator and then still use it. So you can do a lot of pre-work in an emulator without touching hardware, even while touching the hardware is really fast. There's also extra advantage, some of the chips that have extra uh, ICs in there for control where you can actually have extra debug information coming out and uh, attached to the JTAG, to the Zegon, these ones, and so on and so forth. So a lot of possibilities. I leave this to Johan for tomorrow uh, to give the presentation. But yes, fundamentally you can start in QMO really small, and when you're happy then you only touch the hardware. This was more like touching the hardware right away. Um, okay, um, we went through the demo part. Um, so this was just the pure demos that we actually have published, and then gives you a basic idea on how to use Zephyr, how to use the Bluetooth site on it, and how you get started. Um, I think if you are interested and want to work on this one, easy way is take the button example, take the peripheral example for the mouse, put it together, and actually start using it. So you have a two button mouse, left and right, but two buttons are there, left and right button. You build an easy clicker that you can use. Um, if you have a question, go ahead. I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, so I heard it will make it over to the US as well. Okay. 
Uh, it's easy to get in Europe. You just go on Amazon and click buy and it comes next day. I tried to actually look on this one earlier in Amazon uh, US. Uh, not yet, but I've been told it actually is making over the pond as well. I, th I think so. I think this will be uh, available. And I heard they were going to make it here and then build it here as well. Um, so, as I said earlier, take the button and the hit example, put them together, and actually build your own mouse or clicker with this one really easy. You have an accelerometer on there. You can fundamentally also then go one step further. I'm using accelerometer, so I actually, actually can move mouse movement by just moving the mouse in the air. So, this is really up to you guys. Take something more, build something, and uh, get involved, submit this upstream, and see how actually it works well. And you really only have to focus on the application because all the Bluetooth parts are taken care of you and you'll see this is really simple. Um, the thermometer information that I showed can be easily exposed over gut cells if you want to use something, okay, measure the chip temperature, application type of thing. Um, there's a 5x5 five five LED matrix in there. Start making use of these LEDs and display the current times. So you can build a really cheap time clock that actually takes the time from your phone and Bluetooth already has profiles for this one where the phone can expose the time and you can use it from your peripheral device. So it becomes your mini watch or something that has the time from your uh, phone. And if you want to go a little bit further and actually really into this one, I think the 5x5 five five LED matrix would be really nice to use the Apple notification service. And every time you get a notification, you can scroll it through your 5x5 five five LED matrix and I'll just have this on your desk and uh, get you self-distracted all the time. So if you want to watch or something. So there's a lot of possibilities that are just easy to do and I think the combination of the LEDs, the two buttons and the extra pins gives you a lot of options to go with it without having to actually figure out and get a dedicated hardware or get more expensive hardware and this is rather cheap. Um, so we gave you the control back of the micro bit. If you want to uh, do something more with it then actually have just an uh, application type of thing or write a uh, web application thing um, and you can do whatever you want with it. So at this point it's like really if you want to do something with it, go toy with it and I hope it makes it over to the S really soon so you uh, can uh, start and I think in Europe they go up for between 10 or 15 euros right now, so they're really cheap. Um, that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, further questions? What OS was the device originally trying to Excuse me again? What OS that was like when they built it? Was it designed originally for software? No, the original design was running the Nordic soft device, and they built it on top of the Nordic soft device. That's what there was originally on there. Uh, you think he was first. Uh, micro USB. Oh. So that's all it is. Were there alternatives to that for it? Have you been missing it for putting on the micro So I think the only alternative you would have would be the Minute stack or the Minute operating system. Uh, all the other ones, you would have the fundamental problem. You might get it running, but you're missing then a BLE stack. And that really doesn't help you if you want to tinker with the uh, BLE side of things. Because that's where the chip shines, because it's built in uh, BLE radio. Go again. So, um, as far as I know, the BBC is really actively pushing this one, but it's building with their own tools. It's like there's an online tool for this one that they can load things in there and all the education stuff. Um, they never in, uh, intended it to do, be used like this. So, um, but I think it will actually get, at some point, a seventh grader gets bored as well if they have all done and read a couple of buttons. So they can do a little bit more now if you get in a higher grade. So I think this is really important. It doesn't have to be the BBC microwave, by the way. Uh, Zephyr supports a lot of boards. You can get a lot of boards. It's just one of them that has with the 5x5 LED matrix. It gives you a lot of options to do things, while the other ones you have a single LED lid and a single button. Here you have two, you have the extra pins, and you have a nice package coming together. That's the interesting part. But there are tons of boards out there that Zephyr supports right now. The list of boards, I think, is 30 or 40 boards by now. And they have all the board definitions uh, upstream, and you can do whatever you want with them. And some of them have external connectors, so if you're like that and want to up into soldering and soldering something on it, great, go for that one. I think this one is just a nice start for kids uh, or uh, a little bit older children actually to get a little bit, hey, we want to do something more and we want to see how this stuff works. So it's a question, how well uh, BL is the inseparable so possible? So is it like uh, the Mr. Micro and an exception? 
Uh, other boards will work exactly the same. <coughs> the, the only difference, instead of just typing board BBC microbit, you would type board 96B nitrogen or uh, Intel's Arduino 101. You just change the board definition. You don't have to change your code. It will all work. We make sure it works across the board. You're not supposed to touch the BLE stack if you want to change your hardware. Even Arduino 101, where it's actually something that's very cheap, Arduino 101 works as well. The only difference with Arduino 101 works as well. The Arduino One is the only difference because it has a separate, it has multiple cores. This is a single core, the Arduino One has three cores. So you have to flash every core. You have to build Zephyr for every core individually and then flash it. But it will work exactly the same. Any other questions? If none, then thanks very much and have a good evening.